Hello. In this video, we are going to be doing several calculations involving the atomic weights of elements. The atomic weight that you will see listed on the periodic table for each individual element is a weighted average of the weights of the isotopes of which that particular element is found. So we can think of the atomic weight as just an average. Now in your schoolwork, you've probably calculated averages for exams, for example, in a very specific sort of way. So for example, suppose we have an examination and there are only four students taking the exam and the scores on the examination are 80, 80, 100, and 100. The students have done very well on this exam. To calculate the average, we would, if we do it the traditional way, we would simply add up all the scores. So we notice if we add these up, we get a total of 360. And we divide it by the total number of students taking the exam, which is one, two, three, four in this case. So we divide by four, and we would see that the average for our examination is a 90. The students have done well. That is convenient in two particular cases. It's convenient when there are only a handful of scores, there aren't too many, and in a typical classroom, even if you have 50 students, that's not that many. Not too difficult to calculate the average. It is also helpful when there's a wide range of possible scores. So in this particular exam, there's actually 101 different possibilities. We could have a score anywhere from a zero up to 100, assuming that there are no fractional grades. So when we have a wide variety of possible scores, this is the best method, the most convenient method to calculate the average. But it's not the only way to calculate the average. And when we calculate the atomic weights, we're going to use a different technique. And in this case, we're going to use the idea. Um, we often write averages, or what you'll later call expectation values in either statistics or quantum mechanics. For the atomic weights, let's call it ZW. So for a particular element, the weighted average, the atomic weight, we can compute a slightly different way. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the probability of a particular mass. So we'll call it the probability one. So there's a probability that particularly have a particular score on the exam, and then we're going to multiply it by the actual mass that corresponds with that. And since we'll have multiple isotopes, we can continue this process. So we have the probability of the second isotope times its mass. And then we continue for each and every isotope of the element. So before we use this actual method to calculate the atomic weight of some particular element, let me show you how we would apply this method to the previous example where we had the four student exams. We'll recall the student exams scores were 80, 80, 100, and 100. And we notice that we have two different possible scores. So we might call score number one, 80, and score number two, the second possibility, 100. We notice that for the first possibility of 80, two out of the four students scored 80. So the probability of scoring an 80 on the examination was 50%. And we would write this as a decimal. We write 50% as 0 0.50. So that's the probability of getting an 80. And then we multiply it by the actual value the score, which is 80. So for the first possible score, the probability is 0 0.5 and the score is 80. And then we continue this process for the second possible score. Our second possible score is 100 and the probability that a student in this particular exam scored a 100 is also 50%. So we always write that as a decimal, 0 0.50 times 100. And we would notice that if we do the calculation, that we get 40 for the first term, 
plus 50 for the second term, and this gives us an average for the examination of a 90. And this, this style of average computation that we're going to use to calculate atomic weights. For our first problem in atomic weights, we are going to look at the element boron. And boron occurs with two naturally occurring isotopes, boron-10 and boron-11. So for boron-10, the actual mass of that isotope is 10.012937 atomic mass units. So this is for high resolution work. This would give us the mass. For the isotope boron-11, the actual high resolution mass is 11.00. 9305 and there's an atomic mass units. Now we also need to know is the likelihood that a particular boron atom would be boron 10 or boron 11. For boron 10 the likelihood is 19.9 percent and the likelihood that a particular boron atom would be of the isotope boron 11 would be 80.1%. So we can compute the atomic weight of boron. Fine, we'll just put AW for atomic weight. And recall we're going to use the second average technique. So the probability that we would find a particular boron atom as being boron 10 is 19.9%. And recall that we have to write that as a decimal, which would be 0.19. Nine. And then we multiply that probability times the actual mass of that isotope, which is 10.012937 atomic mass units. So that accounts for boron 10. For boron 11, the probability is going to be 80.1%. That's for 0 0.801. And then we multiply that probability times the actual mass of the isotope, which is 11.009305 atomic mass units. And then, relatively straightforward calculation at this point, we would multiply and add, and we would get a result of 10.811. 777 atomic mass units. And we notice that we have a large number of significant figures here. In our percentages, we only have three sig figs. We would notice, so we would truncate this down to three sig figs, but for the sake of comparison to the results that we find on the periodic table, where they use more significant figures for the percentages, we would notice that if we take the first five sig figs, the mass of 10.811 atomic mass units is exactly the value that you'll find in the periodic table. If you find a very small difference between the result of your calculation and the result that you find on the periodic table, there are a couple of reasons for that. One has to do with this idea of how many sig figs are in the percentage. The other is that depending upon uh, the periodic table that you have, in the computation of the atomic weights, occasionally they use isotopes which are not naturally occurring, which only have a very, very small abundance, but inclusion of them in the calculation cause small changes in the final result, at least in the last few significant figures. But this is the general approach that we use to calculate the atomic weight of any particular element, if the element has more than two isotopes, we would just continue the process. We have the probability of the first isotope times its mass. The probability of the second isotope times its mass. Then we add the probability of the third isotope times its mass until we've included all the relevant isotopes. 
and then we get a final result. A nice way to check your result at the end, which is especially useful when we have only two isotopes, is that we notice that when we took the average of the exam, the lowest possible score that students had scored was an 80, the highest score was 100. Whenever we compute an average, the average would have to be somewhere between 80 and 100. If we get a number above 100 or a number below 80, that is a sure sign that we've made a mistake in our calculation. Similarly, in this case, if we were to get an atomic weight of boron, which is just an average, that would be lower than 10.012 or greater than 11, something, um, so if it's outside the range of these two values, we know immediately that we must have made a mistake in our calculation. For our second atomic weight calculation, we are going to do a problem involving the element copper, very, very important metal. And copper is found in two naturally occurring isotopes. One is copper 63, which has a mass of 62.929601 atomic mass units. And the other isotope is copper 65, and it has a high resolution mass of 64.927794 atomic mass units. In this particular problem, we're also be given that the atomic weight of copper, as we might find on a periodic table, is listed as 63.545 and the units are atomic mass units. So given this particular information, we want to do in this case is to figure out what is the percentage of copper 63 and copper 65 that we would find in a representative sample. What are the isotopic abundances of copper 63 and copper 65. So this is not a difficult problem to do, but it, it involves a certain amount of strategy. So the technique that we want to use is we want to assign the variable x, and x is going to be the probability that a particular copper atom is going to be copper 63. So we're going to let the probability of copper 63, we're going to call that x in this case. Now we know that Copper, in this case, only has two possible isotopes. So if we add up the probabilities of copper 63 and copper 65, it has to add up to 100%, which is also equal to the number 1. Therefore, the probability that a particular copper atom is going to be copper 65 is going to be 1 minus x. And this is the part that might be tricky if you haven't seen it before. Now, just to confirm for ourselves, that seems like a strange choice of what to call the probability of copper 65. Notice that if we add these together, I can even just do it right here. If we just add these two probabilities, if I add the probability of 63 and 65, that has to add up the probability of having a copper atom. And since we're only picking copper, that has to equal 100%. If I add x plus 1 minus x, I add that together, notice that I get 1. So that's exactly what we wanted to get for our result. So using these particular facts, we can actually compute the relative abundances of copper 63 and copper 65. Now we can use the same technique that we used before to compute the average, but we know what the actual average is in this case. We know that it's 63. 0.545 atomic mass units, and that this result is equal to the probability of copper 63, and that is x in this case, times the mass of copper 63, which is 62.929601 atomic mass units. And then we add to that the probability that 
a particular copper atom is copper 65, and that's going to be 1 minus x times the actual weight of a copper 65 isotope. And we know from our little table up here that that value is 64.927794 atomic mass units. So again, we just use the same equation that we've used before, but in this case, we're using variables for the percentages. This technique will work if we have only two isotopes. If we have more than two isotopes, we have to use a slightly different strategy to compute the relative percentages. So now we can continue and actually work out algebraically uh, what our result is going to be. And I'll just fast forward to the end here and we would notice that if we solve that we get that x is going to be equal to 0 0.6920, which tells us that this is the probability of having a copper 63 is going to be 69.20%. Because we know that, we also know that the probability of copper 65 is going to be 1 minus x. So that must be a total of 30.80%, which is equivalent to 0 0.308. So almost 70% of the copper atoms are going to be copper 63, and roughly 30% are going to be copper 65. Now, one bit of the calculation to be careful of as you do this is that when you multiply out the 1 minus x, we end up having, at some point in the calculation, negative signs on each side. And we can correct that by essentially multiplying both sides by minus 1. If we were to get a result that the probability x is a negative number, that tells us that we've made a mistake. We can never have negative probabilities. Probabilities can only go between, they have to be a positive, they have to be a, a non-negative number between 0 and 1. In sports, we can give 110%, but we can't do that in science. We can only go between 0 and 100%, which is between 0 and 1. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.